So hi everyone and welcome to this first video for our course on financial economics. So for this video, we're going to discuss a brief introduction of financial economics and show how it's very relevant in the context of the field of economics. So uh, let's start with our discussion. So what is the definition of financial economics? Well, we define it as the study of how individuals can allocate their scarce resources over time. So if you notice, it's some modification of our original definition of economics uh, in that instead of just uh, saying it for a period, we're going to generalize it into all periods of time. But we are also going to say that under conditions of uncertainty. And that, uh, that element of uncertainty is key to understanding financial economics because when we're dealing with uh, things in the financial markets, returns are generally random things. They're random variables and they don't necessarily constitute uh, some deterministic facet. There may be potentially profits, there may not be, there may be dividends, they may, there may not be. The returns of particular securities may be positive, may be negative. So there's this element of uncertainty in there. You can't really uh, make decisions quite as clearly as with you know typical things. So that element of uncertainty is something that we're going to explore in this course. And the cost and benefits of financial decisions are as follows. One is uh, your financial decisions are spread out over time, uh, meaning you make decisions today, you also make decisions tomorrow, and your decisions tomorrow may differ what you have chosen today. And the conditions of the market are usually not known with certainty or in advance by either the decision maker or anybody else in the process. So what is the primary function of the financial system? Well, in implementing the decisions of individuals, um, uh, the individuals will generally make use of the financial system. And the financial system is a set of markets and other institutions used for financial contracting. And uh, this is the venue of the exchange of assets and risks. So of course, we are familiar with the financial system in that this is essentially a market, but it's not just a market, it contains other institutions as well, where we buy and sell bonds or equities or other forms of securities, where we exchange assets, where we have options and derivatives and so on. So this financial system includes the markets for stocks, bonds, and other financial instruments, financial intermediaries, such as banks and insurance companies, financial service firms, such as advisory firms, and the regulatory bodies, such as central banks or the securities and exchange commissions or the tax collection agencies of various countries. So what constitutes the financial decisions of individuals? Well, there are four main things. First, okay, uh, individuals try to act upon the basis of this lifetime consumption and savings decisions. So by this, in order to ascertain the financial decision of a consumer or an individual, we ask how much an in, of an individual's current wealth should they spend on consumption and how much should they uh, save for the future. So of course, it's rational to believe that a consumer doesn't consume everything that he or she may earn in the present period. They would opt to save such that they have, um, they have something to spend for the future in case of uncertainty. And it's exactly this hedge on uncertainty that underlies financial economics. So how does a consumer consider the decision of uh, saving today or spending today versus what uh, he or she will do with that decision tomorrow? Furthermore, um, an, another financial decision an individual could make would be an investment decision. So how should an individual invest the money that they save? So sure, they allocate a portion of their money to be saved, say in the present. Where will that money that's allocated to be saved, uh, where will that go? Will it go in the equities market? Will it go in the bond market? Will it go in the, uh, in, uh, the money market? So where exactly uh, do these sort of savings go? Or what, uh, what do they do with it? Do they start up a business? Do they do something else? And so on. Another key decision is on financing decisions, right? And essentially uh, this underlies when and how should an individual use other people's money 
to implement their consumption or investment decisions. So uh, in regular microeconomics, in the basic thought, we don't open up the market to lending and to borrowing. But with financial economics, we open up that model. Of course, it is reasonable to believe that if a consumer doesn't have enough money to sue, to sort of uh, to sort of optimize their present uh, uh, their present condition, they would opt to borrow money in case uh, they want to finance a big project or they want to smoothen out their consumption, and they would pay that back in the future at some given interest rate. And to some people, that's uh, that's a that's a believable and that's an optimal thing to do because they are uh, in smoothing out. Okay, what we'll notice is in smoothing out consumption over time they may think that borrowing in the present may be the right decision to do so. So how does a consumer or an individual balance when to borrow or when to save or uh, when to uh, apply these decisions? Next, next are risk management decisions and risk management decisions are basically how and on what terms should an individual seek to reduce financial uncertainties. And this is a key element too. So of course, as we've said, uncertainty underlies a lot of the concept of financial economics and of course there will be risk and some consumers don't deal well with risk they don't want risk hence they might want to make decisions that could mitigate or eliminate that risk such as getting insurance or having options whether put options or other types of options on certain financial instruments that they choose to invest in so that element of risk management is also key when it comes to financial economics. So we've been talking about financial economics. Well, we also need to talk about what is the basic tenant of finance. And in essence, the basic tenant of finance is, the, is that the ultimate function of the financial system, why the financial uh, system would exist, is basically to satisfy an individual's consumption preferences. But we have to remember, as we've said in microeconomic theory, uh, an individual's consumption preferences change and they differ for each and every consumer. And how the financial system achieves this, uh, this goal of satisfying consumers' preferences is that it uh, organizes trading, okay, by, uh, it, uh, it's an organized system of trading in financial securities that individuals can purchase and that they can invest in such that it enables these individuals to reach higher levels of lifetime utility than would have been possible in the absence of financial markets. So when we discussed microeconomic theory, we said that the goal of the consumer was to maximize utility subject to some constraint. And then we would assume a one period model generally and we would maximize based on that. But when we add the financial markets into it, the consumer could opt to borrow and gain more money and spend more in the present. And uh, he, he or she could pay it back in the future when he or she has more money when, uh, and that smoothens out their consumption and they could potentially reach a higher level of utility. So the essence of the financial markets is, they, uh, it is believed that because of the financial markets, people could make um, better decisions and uh, would enable them to have uh, more leeway to have potentially a higher level of lifetime utility or utility over time, okay? And they would have a higher level of utility with the financial markets there than without, it, right? And what happens is financial securities, the, the existence of these securities allow for income and consumption streams to be desynchronized or to be made less similar. And we'll delve into this in the next few slides. So what does it mean when there's a desynchronization of consumption and income across time? Well, first we ask the question, why is there a need to disassociate consumption and income across time? Well, it's simple. Income is typically received at discrete dates. So when, say, for example, you have a typical salaried worker, they receive their income usually on a bi-monthly basis, usually on the 15th and on the 31st of the month. So they receive it on certain dates, on discrete dates. But in general, the, the consumer will not only spend money on those two days, like right? they don't just, they don't eat uh, just on those two days. They have to eat to survive and they have to spread out their consumption 
uh, continuously. So it's every day. People consume things every day. They purchase goods, they buy food, they purchase necessities, buy luxuries, and so on. So the process of consumption is something that is continuous, but generally income is received discreetly in, in, on certain dates or in certain time periods. And what, what, what this translates into is because of this continuous um, consumption, individuals have a general preference for a smooth lifetime consumption stream. Now, what do we mean by when we say a smooth lifetime consumption stream? Well, that just simply means that consumption spending, okay, what, what, what we mean by consumption spending will define a sort of standard of living. So based on your income initially, you will have a, a sort of standard of living. And most individuals will find it difficult to sort of alter the standard of living from month to month or year to year. What they want is a continuous increase of the standard of living. They don't want to go to a period wherein their consumption or their standard of living decreases. That will be a disutility to them. So they would want it as smooth as possible, a, a smooth increasing trend of their standard of living and their consumption. And one way to achieve that is through the presence of using financial instruments and uh, investing in securities. And that's the purpose of the financial markets, such that they achieve a higher level of utility than without these markets. So to understand this desynchronization better, we need to talk about the life cycle pattern of income generation. And essentially, uh, this life cycle pattern of income generation and consumption uh, suggests that uh, consumption uh, and consumption spending, uh, these two things are not identical. So income generation and consumption spending, generally, as you look at them through time, are non-identical concepts. And this is because um, consumption spending must be created from the latter. You need to have an income to be able to spend something, right? or at least you need to have some sort of asset holding to be able to spend, uh, which translates into the need to save. So the need to save, i.e. Your, your income is greater than your consumption for retirement so as to permit a consumption stream in excess of income, that is this saving after retirement begins, is an important manifestation of this, this desire. So in particular, a person who is working would want to save enough money for their retirement. Sure, they have benefits. They have social security or maybe retirement benefits, and those are part of the financial system but they would want to have asset holdings that could potentially increase that sort of retirement and that can make them uh, survive on their standard of living, on the basis of their standard of living for the duration of their retirement after they work. So they sort of save up money while they're working for the purposes of when they retire. And that's the manifestation of this life cycle pattern. So this graph I think shows it best. So if you notice, Income when you're early on in life is not really that high, right? It's not really that high, but you need some money to consume. So you usually get this through borrowing, or if you are a typical kid, you get this from your parents. Say this is the time you were born. You don't earn anything, basically. But slowly but surely, your income grows over time. Your income grows over time until a point that maybe if you borrowed somewhere in between these things to have a secure income over time, then you repay those, you repay back those borrowings. And there's a point where it's expected that your income would increase your overall consumption so that uh, you can save during these periods of time. And after you retire, so notice this point is roughly your retirement of the day that you pass away, uh, you have a general stream of income that can meet your consumption desire. So that's the life cycle pattern of income generation. And it's one of the reasons why consumption and income are desynchronized. So that's it for our uh, initial lecture on financial economics. In the next lecture, we will continue on our topic of desynchronization. And we're gonna continue on with the discussion on other concepts on the financial markets. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video.